Log entry, the catch Scarlet Queen, Philip Carney, master. Position 20 degrees, 35 minutes north, 110 degrees, 40 minutes east. Sky fair, wind fresh. Remarks, departed Huang Chowan after involvement by foreign interests. Reason for involvement, Huntsman's Quarry and the Dead Chinese. You know, ladies and gentlemen, someone once said humor is the true democracy. That's why we in America can smile when we tell the stories of the legendary heroes who helped build our country's great industries and institutions. Even an industry like transcontinental transportation has its hero. Windwagon Smith, born on the prairie when transportation was just beginning. Of course, transportation then wasn't anything like it is today. There were no jet-propelled planes, no racing cars capable of going over 400 miles an hour or trains that could cross the country in a little over two days. Most of the traveling in the early days was done by ox team, and if folks covered 15 miles a day, they were doing good. That's what Windwagon Smith wanted to change when he showed up with his prairie clipper. The clipper was a wagon without any kind of animals to pull it, but it had a sail sticking up from the middle of it. When the wind caught the sail, the clipper took off, and Windwagon Smith figured he could cover as much as 70 miles a day. At first, people laughed at him. But when he pointed out how the new country was spreading out and how big cities would be springing up and how people would need transportation for themselves and their goods, they began to figure that maybe the Prairie Clipper was a good idea at that. Windwagon invited the U.S. Secretary of War and the Secretary of the Navy to ride on the Clipper's maiden voyage. But disaster struck. The Clipper got out of control, the Secretary of War rolled out, and the Secretary of the Navy landed in a cactus patch. But Windwagon and his Clipper kept going. No one ever saw the Clipper again, and as transportation grew in America, people all over the country told of seeing Windwagon Smith. He was in the pilot house of the first steamboat to sail up the Yellowstone. He held the golden spike when the first transcontinental railroad was completed. And when the first transcontinental plane roared out of Kansas City, it was Windwagon Smith, the spirit of American transportation, who waved the pilot on his way. Yes, it is a democracy which lets us tell stories of our industries, institutions, and legendary heroes with a twinkle in our eyes and a chuckle in our throats. And as so long as we continue to laugh together as a people, we will live together as a nation. Thank you very much. Three days after we'd reached Fort Bayard, port city for the tiny French settlement of Quangchon, we started to work under our new charter with Kang and the China traders. The first cargo consigned to us was native cloth, metalware, and a half hold of rice, all bound for Berea in the market of Saigon. We waited two days for the cargo to arrive and be put aboard, and our leisure hours, which were few and always after dark, Gallagher and I spent in a bar a few blocks up from the waterfront. It was named the Liverpool, owned and served by a crown subject named Danny. And it boasted passable liquor and a dwindling library of ancient British phonograph records. It was about 9 p.m. after a few of those leisure hours on the eve of our planned departure that Gallagher and I swung down the dock toward the Queen, looking forward to comfortable bunks and the feel of deep water the next day. I missed seeing Gordon, who'd been on gangway watch when we left. As we went aboard, I was rehearsing some strong words to use and dressing him down. But his watchmate, Kohler, hove up in the shadows of the cabin. The look on his face put an end to any thoughts of discipline. There's been trouble, Captain. Where's Gordon? In the forecastle. He's all right now, but somebody laid a club across his head. Who was it? What happened, Kohler? I don't know. We heard two shots, and I ran back here and saw a guy jump off the ship. Gordon was lying here, and when I found out he was still kicking, I looked in your cabin. There's a dead guy in there. I didn't look any closer. And so Mutual continues The Voyage of the Scarlet Queen, written by Gil Dowd and Bob Tallman, and starring Elliot Lewis. As every week, we sail a league farther on The Voyage of the Scarlet Queen.
I'd never seen the dead man before. He was Chinese. Gordon had let him come aboard because he'd identified himself as a clerk from the French firm whose cargo he had. He'd carried a small leather valise and said he had final papers for me to sign. The other man had arrived 15 minutes later and Gordon was slugged before he could count five. Gallagher and I frisked the body. Clutched in one hand was a German-made automatic, unfired. And the other was a note that named him Typhoon Tan. That still left him a stranger, but the note in English was the kind that police anywhere like to ask questions about. It said, Go at once to the American ship Scarlet Queen. It's the quickest available means of escape. Use your own judgment as to the price you'll pay for passage. And it was unsigned. Captain! I rolled it into a ball and put it into an inside pocket. Captain, there's a police officer asking to board. Yeah, that's all we need. They usually go with murder, even at Fort Byard. Okay, Kohler, let him come. I'm keeping that note out of sight, Red. Okay, we don't know anything. That's no lie, but maybe without that link, we can get clear of this mess in time to sail. Oh, here he is. Monsieur, I represent the prefect of police. I can see your uniform, and I don't think much of the way you protect the harbor. Oh, it is truly him. Hmm? Monsieur, I commend you. You are to be congratulated. Uh, congratulated. What do you mean, officer? Uh, you see in this corpse the end of a long and fruitless trail, monsieur. This man was the most desirable criminal in Quoc Chuan. You have done us a great service. Yeah. I can show my thanks now only by the speed in which I remove the unpleasant thing from your ship. Two natives have come with me to carry away the corpse. Uh, pardon. Hang mm-hmm. uh, Tengo! Monsieur... It is my pleasure to tell you that there is a reward which now rightfully is yours. Yeah, well, I'll be satisfied just to get him off of here and never hear another thing about it. Oh, you have done the great service. Thank you. I will not spare one word in my report to say my admiration for you. That's very kind of you. Bonsoir, monsieur. Bonsoir. Gallagher and I looked at one another after they'd left with the body, shook our heads, finally shrugged and got ready to hit the sack. I pulled open the big drawer under my bunk to get dungarees and a jumper ready for our early morning sailing. Discovered that we still weren't clear of the Typhoon Tan situation. His valise was in the drawer. It was lightly packed with personal gear for travel, a thick bundle of French currency, and at the bottom face down was the thing that made me decide, since we seemed to be so popular with the local law, that I'd take the whole thing down to headquarters. It was a large photograph of a white man with a black patch over his left eye. He was sprawled on the floor, his head and shoulders resting in a dark pool that flowed from a point in his throat where the hilt of a native knife protruded. Twenty minutes later, Red and I walked into the office of the prefect of police. Uh, you in charge here tonight, and do you speak English? Oui, monsieur. What is it you wish? I'm Philip Carney, master of the catch Scarlet Queen. One of your men took a body off my ship tonight. This valise belonged to him. We thought we'd better bring it down. Here. Pardon, monsieur? The Chinese criminal that was killed tonight. You guys were looking for him. There was a reward posted for him. Uh, S'il vous plaît, uh, do not speak with such rapidity. Perhaps I, I do not comprehend. Look, a Chinese, Tai Fung Tan... He was a criminal, a desirable criminal. Tonight he was shot on my ship. One of your officers got the body. I look at the day's report. Yeah. Robbery, fire, accident. You must make a mistake. Mistake? No one is killed tonight. I know of no criminal typhoon type. Well, wake up. It happened a couple of hours ago. Your officer left with the body about one hour ago. Where would he take it? He would bring it to this building, monsieur. This is uh, perhaps a trick, No. Yeah, maybe it is. Never mind, officer. The police, put it in your lost and found. If the owner calls for it, don't bother to let me know. Come on, Red. Oui, monsieur. Uh, bonsoir, monsieur. Bonsoir. Hey, Skipper, what goes down with these stupid people? They got rocks in the head? I don't know, mate. If they want to ignore murder, it's all right with me. Come on, let's shove off. All right. After one more at the Liverpool... Back again, Mikey? Let him stay away, Danny. <laughs> that music that lured us back. Yes, a bit of the aisles, doesn't it, now and again? 
Uh, the same? Yeah, neat. With a dash of bitters to kill the taste. Yes, I've seen better chaps than you succumb before Danny's mixing. <laughs> oh, uh, hey, your uh, mateys. And may you have the luck of the Irish that's beyond you, rebellious souls that they be. <laughs> Here's to him, Danny. <laughs> right, Danny. Blimey, it's a toast that shouldn't be drunk. <coughs> Red and I looked at the bottoms of our empty glasses. I think we both realized the difference of taste at the same time. The bitters Danny had shaken in were more than bitters. They were the same knockout drops they serve in Memphis, Corpus Christi, or Seattle. I wondered why it had to be us in Fort Bayard, Quang Chow, and... I found Danny swimming a few feet down the bar, looking at me strangely out of eyes that opened and closed slowly. me, it's a toast that shouldn't be drunk. I tried to get a grip on Red's arm so we could get off our stools together. I got a hold of it. I couldn't move my legs. Gallagher was twins, gaping rubberly at me. Skip, Skip. this drink... They've really slipped us one. The room went into a 45-degree roll to starboard. Stayed there for a second and sailed away, leaving me buried in something that was gray and sick and made my head ache. Then it turned black, and I didn't feel any. <laughs> footsteps. I thought they were mine, climbing an endless stairway to no place. And I got them separated. I knew they were somebody else's. I must have stirred because they moved toward me and stopped. I looked at him bending over me. I decided I must still be unconscious. He had a black patch over his left eye. The rest of the face was pulpy and marked by dissipation, but I recognized him as the man in the photograph. A man sprawled on the floor with a knife in his throat. Come on, Carney. Keep your eyes open. I waited long enough for you. Uh, seeing you that stopped me. Come on, come on. Get your wits about you. Was that a picture of your twin? Uh, you do have the photograph. Good. Where is it, Connie? Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, will you? Here. Here, I'll help you up. <laughs> You'll feel better moving around. Yeah? The dope drink, what was that for? I wanted to get you out of the way so I could search your ship for the photograph. Search my ship, huh? Hope you had a good time. I didn't get aboard. Your ship and the dock are crawling with police. A couple of hours too late, aren't they? Look, you better get out of here before I feel any better than I do now. If you don't, you're going to look deader than you did in that picture. Listen, Carney... I manage the plantation for a firm at Saigon. The richest plantation in French Indochina. You should have stayed there. A rival concern had been trying to force us out. They wrote my employer that I mistreated the natives. That they hated me. Refused to work for me. Skip, I want the devil's always. So try to get up and move around, Red. It helps. Listen to me, Carney. Make their stories ring true. They drugged me and took that fake photograph. Show that I'd been murdered. So that one of their own men could take my place. Carney, I've got to have that photograph. Yeah, yeah, you said that. You did a fair job, but you could have used more time. Your story stinks. Come on, Red. If you can make it, we'll leave. I can make it all right. Don't try to leave this room, Carney. What? Look, the gun doesn't scare me either. You want the picture, don't you? I won't stop at anything to get it. Then you better not get trigger happy with me. Can't think of anyone else who knows where it is. I sail at dawn. Check with me then. Maybe we'll talk business. I'll be watching you till then, Carney. Don't forget that. You know, that might not have worked, Skipper. What did we do to rate this, and what is it? Come on, Red. We're going to check his story on the police guarding the Queen. If it's true, we're going back to the Liverpool and start knocking some teeth down Danny's throat. <laughs> I guess Danny figured we'd be back to thank him for the drink he's got to stand in at the bar. Hey, you. Where's Danny? 
Oh, Mr. Dunny, he ain't like long. That door's straight back. Oh, yes, Mr. Dunny, he ain't there. Come on, Red. And punctually at 12 o'clock to die. Danny, what are you... Oh, it's you. Bonsoir, monsieur. This time, I do not represent the prefect of police. The voice and the face were the same. But his costume this time was a neat white linen suit and a straw hat instead of a police uniform. And his effect was changed slightly by the French-made star automatic pistol in his right hand. You will answer for me a few questions. I will, huh? You are with Frederick Huntsman. Huntsman? Yes. Where is he now? We don't know. We didn't even know his name, but whoever he was, we left him in his room. Did you give the photograph to him? Hardly. People get killed over that thing. I'll tell you the same thing I told him. We know where it is and nobody else does. That's the way it's going to stay, because with it out of sight, we don't think we'll get the belly full of slugs that Huntsman gave the Chinaman. Your logic, it is good. But it is strange that uh, you say that Huntsman killed him when it was really I who did. Let's get it straight, huh? Oh, but monsieur... Why should Huntsman kill him when it was Huntsman who sent him to your ship to buy passage so he could take the photograph to Saigon? I think you and Huntsman are talking about two different things. Why don't you get together and work it out? That I intend to do. Monsieur, it is obvious that Huntsman's words to you were false. It's no news to us. Also, it is highly possible that uh, we three are approaching a friendly understanding. Yeah, with that gun looking at us, it's a cinch. Oh, I am sorry. But it is my business to be suspicious. Nice. Monsieur, Frederick Huntsman is attempting to extort hundreds of thousands of francs from my company. I have been assigned the duty of stopping his plans. Yeah, he's got a story about a company. Oh, too. wait, monsieur. The employees of most of the big rubber plantations in this part of the world are insured by my company. Oh? Huntsman is. And he also has a large personal policy... The beneficiary of both is his wife. Yeah. Now, what do you think of that photograph? Proof of death, no? So that Huntsman and his wife could disappear a few hundred thousand francs richer. Here, monsieur, my credentials and identification. Georges Dumier is my name. Yeah. See, Red? Things finally make sense, even in Quangchown. Yeah, but a funny kind of sense for that poor Chinaman. Poor Chinaman. Oh, pardon. Huntsman paid him well to go to Saigon with the story that he was an eyewitness to the murder. I had to shoot him. He drew his weapon on me to resist, as he thought, arrest. Oh, but, Captain, I apologize for the striking of your crewmen and the subterfuge of the police uniform to get the body so I could search it. Oh, I'll forget it to me, eh? I wish you a lot of luck. I hope you get him. Oh, I think the possibilities are... Very good. Since now I have you with which to bait the trap. Oh, now, well, wait what a are minute. you talking about? We've had enough of this, Dumier. We just want to get out of here. We're leaving at dawn. I am thinking of you, monsieur. I am afraid that your failure to cooperate would be classed as uh, obstructing the course of justice. A charge like that would, of course, delay your sailing, and we do not want that, do we, monsieur? That's a tough one to answer. You strike a quick, hot bargain, don't you? Okay. What do we do? Well, it is better. There is one place where Huntsman will follow you. That is, to your ship. If you will allow that, I will arrive soon after he does. But right now, I will go and lead the police away from your ship. Yeah, I'd like to know what they're doing around the Queen anyway. Oh, oh they are only looking for one who struck one of their members behind the ear took from him his uniform and left him hiding so modestly in the shadows. (laughs) C'est à dire, monsieur, they are looking for me. He really knew his business because by the time we reached the dock, it was clear of police. The rest of the plan went all right, too. I sent all watches below. Red and I went to my cabin... Ten minutes later, Huntsman walked aboard. He was carrying his gun, but he walked hopefully and innocently into our trap. Captain, I want to talk to you. 
That's when I made my mistake. Hello, Huntsman. Wait a minute. What did you say? Where did you learn my name? Uh, from Dan. That's a lie. He didn't know my name. Move over in front of the cabin door, both of you. I haven't come this far to be stopped by anyone who stumbled into me. Stumbled into you? I don't remember looking you up. Who knows I followed you here? How the devil should I know? Maybe half the town, maybe more. Who'd you tell? Wait. Listen. Who's that? I don't know. Who knows I'm here? Nobody be sneaking up on you, making that much noise. Don't try to call. Oh, Captain. Captain Carney. Is he in there with you? Me. Captain. I better answer him. Yeah. Tell him if he lets you and your chief officer take me out so I can get away, I won't kill either of you. Otherwise, I will. Captain. All right. Captain, answer me. Yeah, he's here. He says if you'll let us bring him out, he won't kill us. It is no bargain. Captain, I cannot see him from any of the portholes. I would have to shoot him from the door. Don't move, Carney. Do you hear me, Captain? I am coming in to kill him now. I warn you both, don't try anything. Monsieur, I come now. No, I warn you! As Red and I hit the deck, Dumier walked jauntily into the cabin. His automatic flashing at his hip. His first shot found home, but he never stopped moving forward until he was a foot away from Huntsman. Watching his nerveless fingers drop the gun, his dying body melt to the deck. My company will be very angry he is dead. Is that all you can think about? That was the craziest play I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, that's liable to get dangerous sometimes. Oh, certainement. But when I looked aboard the first time quietly, I found everything bad. So I came aboard and scared him half to death with my kindness. Yeah, well, you can have that approach to me. It's not for me. Oh, but he is dead. Too bad. Yeah, what does happen when a guy is trying to defraud your insurance company and is killed by you, the investigator working on the case? Oh, we have a suicide clause. There is no payment. I told Huntsman I was going to kill him, and he did not surrender. That certainly is a form of suicide. My company would be very angry if it were anything else. <laughs> Dawn that morning, Huntsman's body had been taken ashore, and we cleared the tiny harbor of Fort Bayard in the face of a fresh breeze sweeping out from the mainland. The hatches were covered in snug over our first cargo. We had a place to go, and the crewmen jumped to their stations to give us the sail that would take us there. swept up into the gray morning sky. The jibs rolled out. Then the mizzen. And the Scarlet Queen leaned into her new job with a will that sent the spray flying from her bow. Is she fair with the new weight in her skipper? Handles it like it's nothing. <laughs> this girl is made for cargo work. Now, for all concerned, I hope she gets plenty of it. Where are we bound? Maria? Yep. Not much of a port, but maybe we'll find something to do. Oh, I was afraid you'd say that. What's the matter, Red? Not enough excitement for you? Oh, enough to keep me glad to be alive and sail in a ship like this. You know what I mean? Yeah. She's never taken us into any place that she hasn't taken us out of. Just so that doesn't change. <laughs> Here, Skipper. To the Queen. To the Scarlet Queen. After you, mate. After you. entry, the catch Scarlet Queen, 5.30 p.m., wind brisk, sky overcast, mainsail and mizzen reefed, ship secure for night, signed, Philip Carney, master.
Scarlet Queen stars Elliot Lewis as Phil Carney with Ed Max as Gallagher. And tonight featured Rolf Sedan as Dumier with Frank Gerstle as Huntsman and Ben Wright as Danny. Music scored and conducted by Richard Arant. The Scarlet Queen, produced by James Burton, is written by Gil Dowd and Bob Tallman. This program came to you from Hollywood. Hollywood.